Welcome to AARP, Arizona Hispanic Connection. Educate. Celebrate. Connect. Arizona Hispanic Connection. Welcome, welcome to AARP Arizona Hispanic Connection for another very informative, very important show. We always try to give, uh, present uh, subjects that are of interest to the community and uh, today will be um, another, another opportunity for you to hear of uh, several issues actually. Today we are presenting an update. We are presenting updates. There are some uh, things that are taking place in our state and others <clears throat> more related to the city of Phoenix. And, and actually, even more another issue more in the federal scope of things. So we are going to be presenting um, the issues of or updates related to Rx. Some people might not know what Rx is, but it simply means prescription drugs. And then we're going to talk about access. Uh, uh, many of you may have heard that the unless something uh, someone intervenes or something happens, there will be work requirements for uh, folks that are on uh, access. And that is another important topic uh, that we will be addressing. There's also that light rail issue. Uh, several years ago, the light rail uh, came to Phoenix, so to speak, and now it's uh, in, 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 I would say, in process of moving to, to, to South Phoenix. And there are some, my, we might say, controversies. There, there are some controversies, and so we will address those. Then there are the elections, right? Uh, the elections, uh, uh, the mayor of Phoenix, you know, we have two candidates who are uh, running for that office. We'll give you an update on that. And last but not least, there's also this concept of uh, electric vehicle charging stations. You know, those people who own electric vehicles, uh, you know, there, there's some, some issues about that. And so if you are on Facebook Live, please do us a favor and follow our page. It is extremely important for us to know who we are reaching and also share our program. I can guarantee you that now I'm going to even look in Facebook and I'm going to get uh, a message from somebody telling me that the sound now is working perfectly. Uh, all right. So I have a special guest today. His name is Steve Jennings. Steve Jennings is, in addition to being my colleague, is my friend. He and I work for AARP and we've been going at this for a few years. And I believe that we both enjoy working with each other uh, doing the work of AARP. So, Steve, welcome and thank you very much for joining uh, our show today. It's great to be here, David, and uh, and uh, it's great to work with you, too. You're one of the inspiration employees of AARP. Thank you so much. Now, you are the advocacy director for uh, AARP, and, you know, this term advocacy, as much as uh, we mention it, uh, doesn't kind of resonate with most people. It does with those that work in politics. But just in very simple terms, what is advocacy? Well, I don't really like that word, David, you because don't? I think I, oh, okay. I myself sometimes wonder about that word. You know, it comes mm. from the Latin ad and vocar, which means call to call or call to. And, um, you know, the way I explain it is I say to people, we try and get important decision makers to decide the way that is best for Arizona families. That's how I say that's what my definition of advocacy. But it's it, we have to admit that it's very politically uh, related, correct? It has to do with joining the mechanisms of advocacy to try to lobby, to try to educate legislators, to try to get them to understand the the implications of laws that they're trying to pass and all that good stuff, correct? Yeah, there's getting legislators to, uh, you know, to understand um, the implications or from our point of view, from AARP's point of view, we want the legislators to understand what their impact, you know, 
uh, of the proposal would be on people that are 50 and over and their families. That's one thing you try and do. The other thing you try and do is you try and get legislators attention because Mm. there's a, the legislators, let's take the state legislature for an example, you know, 60, 60 legislators and, uh, somewhere over 2000 bills in Mm. this 100 day session. And, um, a lot of pressure, every group says, pay attention to my bill. And, um, so, you know, uh, and, and if you use, let's say the corporation commission, which are the Arizona regulators of utilities and corporations, they say it's like standing on a, uh, on a, on a line with issues going by you about as fast Mm. as you can manage them. And you can't really give them all the proper attention they deserve. Right. So it's amazing the system works as well as it does. Yeah. And, you know, I, I mean, working for ARP for now 15 years, obviously you have to be somewhat involved with politics, but I'm not the director of advocacy. I'm more the director, of, one of the directors of outreach, which is a bit different. And when I watch politics, especially at the national stage, it's kind of frustrating sometimes to see the the, I guess the maneuvering that goes on and, and then the, the, you know, I don't even want to say the game of, 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 of influences and power. How do you, how, what do you do to stay, to stay encouraged? Because I'm, sometimes it's kind of discouraging to see that, uh, that well, kind of, uh, uh, mechanisms of advocacy. It's, it's a lot like life. You know, mm. what do you look at in your life as and day to day things? And if you look at the negatives, it's tough to go on and you run out of energy. But if you see all the good that happens around you, all the love that happens among people, uh, it's encouraging and gives you energy to go on. And if you think about it, you know, a long time ago in this country, a lot of people smoked cigarettes. Mm. A lot of people ate poisonous food. Our rivers and our streams were more polluted than they are now. Uh, so in many ways, you know, things are a lot better than they used to be. So that's and, an encouragement to know that some things, good things have been uh, sure. passed in legislation and now uh, uh, represent very good uh, things for the community. So sure. that becomes an encouragement. That's right. And you have mm-hmm. to watch it because, you know, fear works to motivate people and to motivate right. politicians. So you'll hear a lot of negative stuff said mm-hmm. and gloom and doom and the sky is falling kind of thing. But it doesn't really turn out all that way. And um, in many ways, things are getting better. So it, it can be encouraging to work in politics. Thank you, Steve. Uh, we will have to go on a short break. Stay with us. This is AARP, Arizona Hispanic Connection. We'll be right back. Educate. Celebrate. Connect.
Arizona Hispanic Connection. Thank you. Thank you for staying with us. This is AARP Arizona Hispanic Connection. Uh, the subject today is updates, RX, access, light rail, elections, and more. We're going to be addressing some uh, several issues, but more uh, uh, in a summary way. We're not going to be able to get deep into these issues because we want to cover them all in, in, a, in, a, in a way of an update. Steve, let's talk about prescription drugs. I think it's no secret that uh, drugs, pres uh, prescription drugs are extremely expensive. It's becoming a, a very serious uh, challenge for people to be able to pay, especially those that take many medications and the expensive ones. And I believe there has been efforts uh, in the past years, I don't know how many years, but maybe, maybe for a long time, to try to get that under control. Uh, first of all, let me ask you a question. Is the issue of the cost of prescription drugs related more to those on Medicare or is it across the board? Well, it's across the board, but uh, the majority of prescription drugs are taken by older Americans, you Got know. It. And uh, and so, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue for older Americans in a big way. In a big way. Now, um, what, uh, how... Why is it difficult for, I guess, the government to get this under control, if you will, or, or to coordinate with the powers that be to make this, uh, the price is more affordable when it comes to prescription drugs? Well, you know, uh, drugs are a miraculous thing in many ways, and you don't want to impede the ability of the researchers and the companies to produce this miraculous medicine that mm -hmm. lets people live much longer than they used to. Right. So, but nonetheless, there's huge profits being made and uh, gouging of people that need the drugs. These are not things people typically have a choice to take. And so, you know, between those two dynamics, um, it's been difficult for the government to get this under control. Americans are paying the highest drug prices in the world. We've heard that before. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with our very partisan Congress, it's almost like government is broken because right. these drug companies are making billions in profits off seniors and hardworking Americans. So Congress needs to do something to lower prescription drug prices. Yeah. Now, we understand that the manufacturers of drugs, their claim is we have to sell them at this price because like you said, we, ha we have to invest in researching and producing them. That's probably their main argument for justifying the high prices. Am well, I right it, on that? You know, interestingly about that argument, you know, we've heard that a lot. And um, the drug companies all in all spend more on advertising each year than they do on research and, and developing new drugs. So um, this advertising drives up the cost of drugs to the point where some seniors are having to choose between food and medicine. So we believe it's time that Congress cracked down on drug companies for charging Americans the highest prices in the world on medicines they absolutely have to have. So they invest in research, they invest in manufacturing the drugs, they invest in uh, and promoting the promoting the drugs. How about lobbying? Is that something that they also invest a lot of money in? Well, the yes, they have a very powerful lobby in Washington and in the state legislatures, too. And uh, in Washington, they have actually more lobbyists uh, than there are Congress people. So, but I don't like to emphasize that because it makes people feel powerless. Mm. And nonetheless, the Congress does feel under a lot of pressure. AARP put over 140,000 emails into President Trump when his State of the Union was coming up last 140, week. 140,000 emails. Yes, and we wanted him to mention this prescription drug prices in the, and he um, did actually, in the State of the Union. Yes, mistaken. he did. Yeah, yes, yeah, he yeah. did. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, the pressure goes all the way to the, to the top. Now, from ARP's perspective, what are some of the, the things that potentially on the, or are on the table that could be used uh, to bring down the cost. What are some of those those uh, things that well, probably I mentioned this advertising business, you know, uh, that the companies are doing that actually drives up the cost of the drugs into the unfair price level, and um, uh, the 
you know, the Congress to pass something needs to come up with a proposal that can pass. And there's going to be a hearing um, on Tuesday, February 26th of the Senate Finance Committee. You know, the work of the the Congress and in state legislatures is done in committees, and they're going to hold a uh, hearing called Drug Pricing in America, a Prescription for Change Part 2. Hmm. And they're going to call in these big drug companies and tell them that they need to testify. They're going to call in Pfizer. They're calling in Johnson and Johnson. They want Bristol Myers Squibb and uh, AstraZeneca are among the companies that, that have been invited to present testimony. AARP is going to be there with our staff and volunteers in red shirts listening closely. So, but, but what is it that they have to uh, uh, present, these companies? Are they going to justify their prices, why they can I mean, what, what is expected for, uh, to, uh, what are we supposed to expect to hear from them? Well, you know that it's a, uh, when you're testifying to Congress or the state legislature, if you don't tell the truth, it's a crime. Okay. And you can go to jail for mm-hmm. that or you right. can be fined for that. And so when you get these companies to testify, and you can watch this on TV and and a lot of congressional testimony, that very pointed questions are asked by Mm -hmm. our elected representatives. uh, And from that, you hope to uncover, you know, um, uh, the things that uh, can give you ideas on proposed ways to get these things under control. Now, I I know that the generic drugs uh, versus brand is a big issue. Can you kind of explain just a little bit about how that could potentially bring the cost down and why it doesn't happen? The drugs are patented, you know, for a certain period of time. And then once the patents expire, you know, then generics can be manufactured Mm -hmm. that are medically equivalent and are much cheaper. And, uh, you know, these biological drugs, I'm referring to ones that are, you know, life forms are used to generate and can be fabulously expensive. I uh, talked to one woman the other day, her drugs were um, $18,000 a month. And um, uh, the Congress passed a law sometime back that allowed the patents on biologicals to last longer and uh, they could change that law and make those patents run out quicker and then uh, you know their competitors would manufacture a nearly identical medicine that has the same effect and would be much cheaper. Now uh, if we focus on the Medicare beneficiaries I have heard for a long time that uh, Medicaid and insurance companies have uh, the ability to negotiate prices with manufacturing companies but not Medicare. Wouldn't that help a lot if that was allowed? Well, absolutely, that would help. And also, if you could import the drugs from oh. other com- countries that have price controls on them, uh, you know, if, uh, such as Canada, then that would be much cheaper, too. Those are both proposed so ways allowing, to do it. So allowing the uh, generic drugs to be available sooner to uh, allow Medicare to negotiate prices, being that they have such, I mean, they have, what, it's over 50 million beneficiaries of Medicare that they they have a large pool of, peop- uh, pool of people that they can use as leverage to negotiate. And now you're saying about uh, uh, bringing drugs, uh, importing drugs from, uh, say, Canada or other countries. I mean, just those three things, I, fe- I feel that, it would it would make a lot of progress. Those are all those are all among the proposals, mm-hmm. yeah, that are being talked about. And is ARP in favor of all those? Well, ARP is in favor of ways that can keep you know these miraculous medicines being produced and researched and developed, and also that they should be affordable to people. Right. So there are a number of different proposals, and the real key isn't you know, always what is the best proposal? It's the best proposal is what you could get through the Congress. Right. And those often have to come from the Congress from hearings such as these that are going to occur next week. So it is kind of complicated. I mean, people may complain, and I think we all hear it or at some point may complain of the price of drugs. So it's kind of complicated, uh, the process of getting this uh, under a more affordable 
uh, scenario, if you will. It's complicated, but it's doable. And other countries have done it. And there's, you know, there's no reason that Americans should have to be paying the highest prescription drug prices in the world. I myself take four drugs every morning. My co-payments every month are $120. And I was standing in line at the pharmacy the other day, and I saw an older gentleman not take his drugs because he could not afford to pay what they were going to he was going to have to pay. So he handed them back to the pharmacist very quietly and walked away. And I, I just felt terrible seeing that. Before we end our uh, second segment, Steve, I would like you to, I would like to ask you to let the audience know what is the way or ways that they can uh, play a part in, in this, in this uh, important effort to get prescription drugs under control is can, what can they do? Well, what they can do is they can communicate to their congressperson, their federal representative, this is not an issue that can be solved on the state level, communicate that they want that to be their number one priority and that they're watching them on it and to get the job done, use common sense solutions to lower the cost of prescription drugs. Now, there's a, in the past that when we have addressed issues that have to do with advocacy and lobbying, I believe we have said, said that it's important to also join yourself to a, a group who has uh, influence and power. Would you uh, recommend people to, to, to join AARP, not necessarily the membership, but just in, in, in how can they join AARP so they can get emails when, uh, when uh, there's a, a time to reach out to their representatives, senators, uh, with information about this. Is there a way that they can uh, connect with AARP? Well, or if you go on to that? AARP's website okay. and um, you give that address on a, mm -hmm. a regular basis and click on advocacy, you can sign up to receive e-alerts. Our Facebook page, if you scroll down, you can find uh, links to receive our e-alerts. You'll get them both from National receive, AARP. Uh, what is it? Receive? E E-alerts? E-alerts, e electronic alerts Got to it. your email that have <laughs> links in them where you can send, you know, the uh, the technology will send your communication directly to the right representative from Congress or, or the state legislature from you. And Perfect. you'll be alerted when they're about to make decisions on these issues and what our position is. And you can choose whether to send them that pre-written or, or change it to whatever yeah. you think. And, and, and a lot of times it's better to join yourself to an organization that already is doing this. It makes it a lot easier. Stay with us. We will take a short break. When we come back, we're going to talk about the access program and how uh, most likely um, they are going to implement work requirements for people who have this uh, program. So stay with us. We'll be right back. This is AARP Arizona Hispanic Connection. Educate. Celebrate. Connect. Arizona Hispanic Connection. Thank you very much for staying with us. This is AARP, Arizona Hispanic Connection. I don't know why, but every time we do a show, I feel good. I feel that uh, communicating good information, trustworthy information is, is a, an amazing thing. It, it just gives uh, us a good feeling, and I hope that you are 
on the other end. Uh, also, uh, receiving this information is really important. And this basically shows where ARP's uh, focus is. We really, uh, if you will, fight, fight for benefits of, of people and, and programs, et cetera. So basically, um, again, this is AARP, Arizona Hispanic Connection. I'm your host, David Parra. And one thing that I want to ask you is please, please, please join our page. Join our page. We are really, really asking folks to let us know that you are receiving this information and it's valuable, valuable to you. And the best way to do it is through Facebook. Because of time, we have to go right to the next issue. And Steve, let's address access. We understand and we know that access is, is what we call uh, is the Medicaid program in Arizona. And it stands for Arizona Healthcare Cost Containment System. It, it has various uh, benefits, various health programs, and also uh, other um, benefits. But now with the uh, access program, and I, 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 I have to believe that this was not the first time that they tr that that it was tried. But now it's it's basically, would you say, a law that they will implement work requirements? Please help us understand the process, how that when uh, how that became so, and what does it mean? Well, it uh, was a law passed by the legislature that every year access administration would have to apply for permission from the federal government to require that some of the people on the program have to work or look for employment while they're on the program. And uh, the previous administration under President Obama never approved that application, but the current administration has approved it in a number of states, including Arizona. And it only applies, you know, there's about 1.9 million people on access in Arizona, 1.9 million, almost 2 million. And this only applies to about 120,000 of that 1.9 million, 120,000. At first they were saying it applied to 400,000, but it looks like it's down to about 120,000. And it's only applies to able-bodied people who are on access and between the ages of 19 and 49. Between 19 and 49, but what that means that anybody who's able to work. Able-bodied, yeah. That's what it means, correct? Able yeah. to work? With some exceptions, yeah. Right. But they need to, uh, now, do, if, they're, if, if they're not working, are there other things they have to be doing so that they don't get their, their coverage uh, suspended? Well, it means that they have to gain and maintain employment or have job training or education or volunteer service experience for 80 hours a month hmm. for that people between 19 and 49 with some exceptions. Uh, so they're going to have to be able to prove that they're working or taking job training or education or or important volunteer service. So nothing like, oh, I'm looking for work, but I can't find it. That's not going to cut it. They have to no, actually that be would, on train. That would cut it as long as okay. you can prove that you're looking for work oh. and you can demonstrate that. Okay. Yeah. It, it, they have not um, uh, listed the forms you will use yet, so we can't see at this point how you will prove you are doing that. Right. But this also, uh, David, it's very inter uh, important people understand, this does not begin until January 1 of 2020. So in, a, in next year. That's right, next, next January 1. So they have this much time to get that program organized. And I understand that, the, that they will send information to those that have the, access, uh, the, you know, the acute care plan from AXIS so to basically inform them of all these rules and and how to comply with them, correct? That's right. They'll be they'll be notifying people that uh, that this is um, a requirement. This eighty hours a month of job training or work or education. Now there's certain people that within that group that mm -hmm. are not going to have to uh, do this work. Okay. So if if a woman is pregnant. Okay. And past birth for 60 days, she's exempted from it. Mm -hmm. um, if you're a, a member of a federally recognized tribe, you, you're not going to have to have the work uh, requirement applied to you. Okay. If you have serious mental illness, uh, these are just some of the, um, right. 
Uh, if you're a full-time high school, college, or trade school student, mm-hmm. uh, if you're homeless, uh, if you're taking care of a child younger than 18, right. um, or if you're taking care of a person with a disability, and, uh, and there are other exceptions to this. That's why of the, you know, the 1.9 million people on Medicaid, this actually boils down to about 120,000. 120,000 people might get, be affected. Now, let me ask you, Steve, if a person is going to have to work at least 80 hours a month, correct? Every or, hour? Or look for employment. Okay, so let's say that they work. Wouldn't, wouldn't that put them over the limit of access in, in, in some instances, it may. Okay. It may, depending so upon... So depending on what type of job and what type of earnings they have. Right. It could wow. do that. But that was the intention of the legislature, saying to get people to uh, encourage to them to gain and maintain meaningful employment. Now, interestingly, in Arkansas, mm-hmm. one of the states that already implemented this, right. in the first seven months that it was running, 18,000 people in the state Lost Medicaid coverage, 18,000. Wow. In the, on the first month, you said? No, in the first seven months. Seven months, okay. Yeah, and uh, it's terrible. Mm-hmm. And um, so if you think about it, you not only have to look for work, but you have to prove that you are. Right. And depending upon the forms you have to fill out and how you have to submit them, and whether they're submitted properly, whether they're filled out properly, whether they're in on time, yeah. whether they're complete, and if they depend on that submissions to be done electronically, some folks may be challenged with that. They might not even have internet or what have you. Correct? And so you see in one state that has implemented this, there's 18,000 people lost essential medical care right, coverage right. in the first seven wow. months. We don't want that to happen here in Arizona. And, you know, a lot of people on Medicaid have behavioral problems. Mm-hmm or maybe mental issues, and are they going to be capable of meeting these requirements? So, you know, community groups, AARP, the Children's Action Alliance, and a number of other groups will be working with the administration to try and make that as doable mm. as possible, as, right. as consumer-friendly as, yeah. as the, possible. The last question is, uh, I don't know if you have this, uh, but... Um, if they don't comply, I thought I read somewhere that there's going to be a, they're going to suspend covers for, a, a, I think, two months. Do you remember that? That's, That's right. Yeah. Two months, right? Yeah. And, and then they can re- be reinstated. But again, they have to meet all these requirements. Yeah. And, you know, one of the problems with that is if people get sick during that two months and go to the hospital, you know, the hospitals treat you. And so you're going to see the hospitals here having to raise other people's bills to cover the people, again, that are not covered by, you know, access. So uh, if you don't pay for this one way, you pay for it another. Of course. Okay. So that's another update. So we just uh, spoke about the prescription drug costs. They are just extremely over the top and many people are struggling to pay for those drugs. And there are many, many efforts going on to get that under control. The second update is regarding work requirements in the program of access. Let's move on uh, to another issue, and that is the light rail. This pertains specifically <clears throat> to the city of Phoenix. I remember a few years ago when the um, uh, light rail came to Phoenix, and, and you and I were talking before the show how uh, the <clears throat> basically the downtown Phoenix has, uh, has been transformed, and in part thanks to the light rail, because you, you were uh, uh, saying that some businesses, um, you know, are motivated to invest in apartments and in, in businesses where the uh, where, where whatever there's a light yeah rate. there's currently um 25,000 apartments under construction you know Maricopa County is the fastest growing mm. county in the United States right, right now and there's 25,000 apartments uh under construction within one half mile of the existing light rail so now it's 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 moving to South Phoenix, and I don't recall there being that much opposition in the past. I may be mistaken. When it went, say, a little north, uh, north of uh, Central, remember they went all the way to I think Bethany Home. Now it's going to South Phoenix. What is basically the 
I guess the concerns, uh, to, to, put, to put it lightly, the concerns of the light rail going south of Phoenix. Well, the, you know, the issues have, uh, that have been gone back and forth in the public meetings have been that Central Avenue and South Phoenix would be reduced to two lanes from four lanes. Mm -hmm. And a number of the uh, small merchants there along Central Avenue feel like their businesses would be negatively impacted during the couple years it would take to put the line in mm. so how does it look is it, it what, what's next what's going to happen next to well, determine whether it's going to go through or not what happened was a group called building a better phoenix has um, submitted uh, enough signatures to place it on the ballot it would be uh, the city council's verified those signatures and it would be in a special election on August 27th. August 27th. August, yeah. Okay. Uh, don't get that confused with the mayoral election, right. which, you know, is underway now. Yesterday, right. early voting began on the mayoral, the March 12th. And we'll touch 12th. upon that next. But yeah. So, so August 27th. 7th, we will get to vote um, uh, whether we, now is there something to be concerned about? Well, the there's name an election. How is going there's to be an election scheduled? But a, a group has filed suit okay. against the uh, the initiative mm. uh, appearing on the ballot. Okay, it has to do with the way the signatures were collected, and it has to do with the uh, the description of what would occur that was used on the petitions. Uh, and that may invalidate the whole thing. And there's a court hearing in April on that. So this could all, there may not be an election audit in August. And then again, they may stay tuned. Stay tuned. Is, so basically, is there anything that we can do as a public to stay tuned? Is that with the city of Phoenix? Is there anything going on online or something that we can uh, well, tap uh, into? Well, all with our usual sources of information, uh, you know, the radio and the television right. and the newspaper uh, are going to be paying attention to this because, um, you know, if you think about it, uh, uh, ASU moved their downtown campus uh, to, you know, they put up this downtown campus in Phoenix. The students go back and forth to Tempe on the light rail. You can see the difference that has made if you look at North Central Avenue, the amount of construction uh, that's gone on there. Uh, there have been a series of governmental decisions in Mesa and Tempe and Phoenix on the light rail. It's been voted on by the public. So uh, this is going to be a, an interesting place. The, the initiative says that you cannot, if it succeeds, that you cannot spend any money on the light rail expansion and all the money, 3.5... Well, all the money has to be used for other forms of, of transportation. Mm -hmm. It would result in losing $3.5 billion of federal funding. That could not be used for if, anything else. If it doesn't go through with the to, If to the South initiative Phoenix. is a, to stop the light rail is approved. Wow. A lot is at the stake. The city would lose $3.5 yeah. billion federal dollars. Thank you, Steve. Uh, stay tuned. We're going to go uh, to a short break and be back uh, to address the... Elections for mayor of Phoenix. Uh, we have two candidates, so stay tuned. We'll be right back. This is AARP Arizona Hispanic Connection.
connection. Educate. Celebrate. Connect. Arizona Hispanic Connection. Thank you. Thank you for staying with us. This is AARP Arizona Hispanic Connection. The subject today is updates on RX, on Axis, on the light rail, on elections, and one more issue right after it. If Just stay with us. We have Alex Juarez joining by Facebook, and Steve, he's asking why the vote in August if the voters had already approved the light rail expansion? Well, that's part of Arizona laws that even though you've had an election, people can gather enough signatures to Got put it. it back on the ballot, mm. and that's what's happened. In, amazing. Now, there is a little tricky part that potentially could um, be misunderstood in the ballot. Can you elaborate on that? Well, the initiative is called Building a Better Phoenix, and so one would be inclined to, you know, go, oh, well, that's great. That's what I want to do, too. Uh, and so if you vote for that initiative, it means you have to stop putting money into the light rail for mm. expansion. Wow. It's so a little tricky it's, there. Uh, yeah. If you believe in the light rail, you don't want, you know, in expanding the light rail, you don't want that to succeed. That is so interesting. Can yeah. you repeat that once again? Well, it's called building a better Phoenix. Mm -hmm. But what it says is any money that was supposed to be spent on expanding the light rail into new areas has to be spent on other forms of transportation. So if you want to see more light rail, you vote against that initiative. Right. Okay, we only have about uh, eight more minutes, Steve. And uh, uh, the question about the, the race, um, can you explain why we're having a, an election, another election, you could say, of two of the candidates for mayor of Phoenix? Who are they and why are we having? I, I know it has to do with laws, but... Just uh, if you wouldn't well, mind we, sharing with the public. Yeah, you, you know, we're going to, we're underway. Voting started yesterday, early voting, and you've probably gotten your voter information pamphlets in the mail. It's a mayoral election here in the city of Phoenix. There's two candidates, Dan, Daniel Valenzuela and Kate Gallego. And, um, uh, you know, there was already the no November election, but uh, there were four candidates and no candidate got 50%. Kate Gallego got 19% more than... Valenzuela did. Okay, 19%, neither, but neither exceeded the 50. So there's a runoff election. So that's part of the rule. So so the winner has to win by a by by gaining 50%. That's right, yeah. And if they don't, then there's the two, uh, the two top the, candidates run uh, again, yes, pretty much. Yes, and that's, that's on March 12th is the final day that you can drop off your ballot. Uh, if you got an early mail-in ballot, you can drop it off at a voting center or a polling place. That's what I do. I wait till the very last day to see to see if anything's happened or anything is learned or okay. anything like that. And then I take it in. Interesting. And, uh, you know, typically very few people vote in these kind of elections, hmm. these special elections. So every vote counts. And uh, especially to the Hispanic listeners here, get your people out and get those votes in and uh, let's uh, get the best person in there. You, you know, AARP is nonpartisan. Right. We're not for one candidate or, an or another. We believe the issues challenging older people are not Democrat or Republican issues. They're American issues. So make your best choice and get voting. Right. Now, I, just a quick question. Do, are there other cities in other states or even here in Arizona that have this rule that the winner has to win by it's a, That's 50%? a very common, yeah. That's it's a very common, common rule, yeah. So the winner has to win by, 50, by gaining 50% 50 of the votes, and if not— then the, the top two candidates have to literally... That's my understanding, yes. Now, do they, do they campaign? I mean, I assume that they, they keep oh, yeah, campaigning. Oh, yeah, yeah. If right? you drive around Phoenix, you can see the signs all over, Got yes. Yeah. And we, there have been a number of forums and... Uh, we actually tried to have a, a debate here in, uh, in the radio show, but we just couldn't get both of them because their schedules are so busy. Right, they're very busy. But we busy. wanted to have the Daniel Valenzuela and Kate Gallego to come here to the studio and debate. And we couldn't manage to do it. Well, you know, ARP has quarterly breakfast for people That's in the, right. interested in aging. And they, they came with the two other challengers uh, before the November Th election that and talked right. about older people's issues. That is right. So we did have them. And actually, if anybody wants to see how that debate uh, go uh, or went, 
Uh, you can go to AARP Arizona on Facebook. It, we uploaded that video, AARP Arizona, and actually also on our uh, platform, AARP Arizona, Hispanic Connection, and that debate was posted there. And at that debate, they had both said they had experience in their family with older relatives and some of the challenges they faced. Right. Steve, uh, let's address the last uh, issue that we have today in the form of updates. That's basically what we're doing. We're presenting updates today. We talked about prescription drugs. We talked about the work requirements now being implemented in the access program started in 2020, January 1. Uh, then the light rail situation going to South Phoenix, elections, the mayor, mayoral uh, elections here in Phoenix. Now let's uh, talk about the last issue, and that is electric vehicle charging stations. What is this all about? I'm sure many people have never heard of such things. Well, you know, uh, uh, the car manufacturers are increasingly introducing cars that are either partially or all electric uh, that you recharge by plugging them in to the electricity grid. And uh, the Tucson paper recently said that three quarters of one percent, three quarters of one percent of all the vehicles registered in Arizona mm -hmm. are uh, electric vehicles. Right. Some of those are, are trucks are not only cars. And, uh, you know, the argument is they're cleaner than gas powered vehicles. And that's a kind of debatable or they're better for the environment. People debate those things. But nonetheless, people are buying them. Some people. And, uh, you know, there are some less expensive ones. And then there are ones in the six figure range, hmm. too. And 90% um, uh, of them are charged at home. People have chargers in their home. Uh, some of these are put out big, big, powerful charge. I assume the that car the quickly. chargers uh, uh, are different, right, than the regular electricity. With, that, with, so mostly, some, yes. Some there's, company has to go in there and build it? Yeah, there's actually six different uh, plugs I on see. the chargers. You know, it's not standardized. Mm -hmm. And uh, companies like Blink is one company, and another one is called ChargePoint offer that they'll come into your garage and install a charger for a certain amount of money for you to charge your electric vehicle with. Uh, and there are chargers in public parking garages that you'll see that people have their cars plugged in. You'll see a sign that says don't park in this space because mm -hmm. it's for electric vehicles. Right. And um, so the proposal that's come to the Arizona utility regulators is that uh, why aren't there more chargers? Mm. And, um, and the commission has said in a policy that it would like to incentivize more chargers. In other words, get more built so that it's easier to and more convenient to charge your electric vehicle. And, um, and they have uh, uh, said that stakeholders or people interested in these things that maybe have a money interest and and the public has because this policy says that the big three utilities you know APS and uh, uh, UNS down south and west and then the TEP Tucson can increase their rates or you know may be able to increase their rates to fund more charging stations. Wait, wait, wait. Are you saying that they want to build more stations, more public, right? And basically add a charge to our bill well or or make the electricity slightly cost more right uh and so you know aarp has an argument with that that the public should pay for higher rates for chargers they may never use and mm. the reason we don't like that is because already these companies like blank that i mentioned or charge point are already competing against each other to install chargers if you i rode my bike around a couple weekends ago uh, to the various garages in downtown Phoenix, and almost everyone had chargers already really? installed. Mm. And if they're being, you know, installed competitively, why should our electric rates go up when we don't even have electric cars? You said uh, only three quarters of a percent of one percent of folks own those vehicles. Well, of all the vehicles registered, are electric vehicles. Okay. Okay. So one, one, three quarters of a percent of registered vehicles are electric vehicles currently. So yes. I'm sure those folks, the owners of those vehicles, would l welcome the idea of having more public charging stations. Yes. But the idea, think. the argument against it is that the, so then if they're not going to be, uh, uh, the cost is not going to be charged to the consumers in general. 
What is the alternative? Well, AARP believes that the companies that make money, they're already doing this. They make money off installing these charging stations and charging people for using them. So why shouldn't the people that choose to buy electric cars and the companies that install these chargers pay for them? They're already doing it that way. Why do we need to raise electric rates to install more? Hmm. We believe that the companies that are making the money, AARP's position is, if it's already being done competitively at a profit, then leave it to that. If people choose to buy these vehicles, they can pay a little bit more for the right. charging. So wh- what is the... I, I saw uh-huh. one blink charging station that was 30... It was three cents every 30 seconds. Three cents every 30 so it's seconds? About, yes. So it's about six cents... A minute. A, a minute. That's about $3.60 an hour to charge your car. Mm-hmm. That, I'm sure, is a rate that is paying for the charging station's installation. Right. Why should the public have... You know, the poor people and the fixed income people, the seniors... Which will never probably have uh, an who electric car. are already car. stretched on right, their money right, have right. to pay higher rates for people that choose to buy electric cars. We have about a minute. Uh, what is the government entity that eventually is going to be key in the decision making of, of this uh, uh, charging station? Well, in the Arizona Constitution, uh, it established the Arizona Corporation Commission and it regulates utility rates. And okay. it's, it is five elected commissioners. They're all elected statewide. And uh, they have a lot to do with how much you pay on your electric bill. Repeat the name of the entity again. Arizona Corporation Commission. Arizona Corporation Commission. And they have a lot to do with what you pay on your electric bill, your gas bill, and your water bill. They are the are they called regulators? Would you say? Yes, they're, they are the they're regulators utility regulators. Of utility bills. Yes. Wow. Well. Uh, thank you so much, Steve Jennings. Uh, Thanks the, for having us. Yes, advocacy director of AARP Arizona. And uh, we hope that uh, this updates uh, that we provided to you today uh, were helpful to you. There's a lot going on in our state. And I want to just uh, remind you again that if you uh, watch this video uh, afterwards uh, and you are on Facebook, please, please, please uh, follow our page, AARP Arizona Hispanic Connection. And also uh, we're asking you to... uh, Uh, Help us spread the word. Tell your friends and family about these shows. They are very, very focused on education, uh, and that's basically what we do. We're bringing to you many, many important issues that affect you and me in our daily lives. So thank you again. This was AARP, Arizona Hispanic Connection. See you next time.